Thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. We are glad that you guys are here. Can we stand to our feet tonight? Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for the night. We thank you to give us a privilege and opportunity to come in this place to worship you, God. Father, one thing that I ask that you would mess us up tonight. Let the Holy Ghost come in here and just mess us up. Y'all, can you stretch your hands up? Can you stretch your hands and to your neighbor? Can you stretch your hand to a neighbor and ask God, say, God, mess them up. God, mess them up. Stretch your hands to the worship team. It's like, God, mess them up. <laughs> Stretch your hands back to the uh, sound booth and say, God, mess them up. <laughs> Look, grab it. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor you're glad to see him here tonight.
There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You are living home. Your presence. Tasted and seen of the sweetest of love. When my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. In your presence, Lord.
come flood this place fill the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord. your presence
sing it out one more time. Here I am, here I am, Lord. Here I am, worship you, the King. All I am, worship
Well, Father, our heart does sing out how much we love you tonight. We love your presence. We love your goodness. We love the fact that you're holy. And because you're holy, you don't change, and that gives us hope because your love won't fail us. And Lord, tonight as we worship you, I know that there's people in here that you want to minister to. There's healing that needs to be released. There's destinies that need to be stepped into. So, Father, tonight we just thank you. We trust you. We look for you where you're working in our lives. And we, we commit to being a people that will join you where you are. Father, tonight we ask that you will not only inhabit our praises, but your spirit will hover heavy as Stephen brings the word Father as we as we transition Lord I ask that you will guide and direct and lead and be glorified tonight in Jesus mighty name we pray amen amen in God's presence good amen. that was worth getting out here this evening for and then we have the bonus of Stephen Stephen, go ahead and make your way up here. I always like surrounding myself with people bigger than me. Makes me feel safe. Stephen has got a call in his life. And, uh, you know, Stephen, every time I see you in worship, uh, you're always worshiping with a smile. And uh, you and your wife. And uh, I see what God's been doing, watching you, hearing some CDs and uh, you're a blessing, and I want this body to be blessed as you continue to grow in your gifting and, and sharing that call. So uh, we're happy to have you tonight. Aren't you glad that Stephen's a part of our body? <laughs> Stephen's another example of what God's doing. He's, he, he doesn't send people here that just like to breathe oxygen. He sends people here that's got a call just like you have. So Stephen's uh, here to... Sh Show us what it means to step out and walk in your call. So share a little bit with us about that. We love you, brother. You have 15 minutes. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> we love you, brother. Well, uh, if we went back to the very first time I ever preached, 15 minutes would have been plenty. It's a kind of a running joke in, uh, in my family that I preached all of my notes and everything I knew about the Bible, and then I went over my notes again, and it still only took about five minutes. So... But uh, I, am, I am thankful to, I'm just thankful to be here. I am, uh, I just count it a privilege and an honor just that, that God had chose me. And he's chosen each and every one of you. You've all got a, a calling on your life, whether you know it or not. Uh, we serve an awesome God and we've got some work to do. There's some great and mighty things that God's wanting to do with his people and he's He's wanting to, to do some, some awesome things, and it's going to require people just like you that are willing to go out on a Sunday night whenever you could have stayed home, uh, you could have been watching some TV, you could have been doing just about anything else, but you decided you wanted to go and be in the house of God. And it's people like you that God uses to change the world. I want to, I want to speak with you for a few moments. Um, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 16. I want to talk to you about the church tonight. Uh, God's really been dealing with me for the, uh, the better part of the past three months, I guess, uh, about the church. And I want to talk to you about the church and what he's been, been speaking to me. I still hear some pages turning, but unless you've got an iPad like, uh, like Pastor, you can't hear that. Uh, but the book of Mark, chapter 16, uh, I want to read just a few verses of Scripture in your hearing, and then I want to just share with you what I believe God's speaking to me. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through, uh, through 18, it says, And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs shall follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will, not, it will be by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Father, we thank you for the word that you've given us. We thank you for this, 
this Bible that we can hold in our hands, that you've given us your word in, in print, that we can take it with us on our jobs and, uh, and everywhere we go, we can hide it in our hearts. We just thank you for this word and we pray that you would just speak to your people tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, well, like I said, I want to talk to you about the church. Uh, God's really been dealing with me the past few months about the church, and I've been spending a lot of time in the book of Acts. I know I didn't read from the book of Acts, but, but we'll get there in just a few moments. But uh, I've really been spending a lot of time in the book of Acts. It's one of my, one of my favorite chapters, uh, one of my favorite books, rather, in the entire Bible. It's, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's our roots. It's our heritage. It's, it's where we came from. This is the, the history of the church, and it's one of the most amazing pieces of, of history that we have. And, and if you've never read the entire book of Acts, I, 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 please read it. It is, you, you will learn so much about who you are in Christ by reading what the early church did and, and, and how they came to be. And it's just amazing. But, but God began to, to deal with me and uh, he's, he get, began to speak to me and telling me, he's telling me that, that he's wanting to, to, to bring about a revival in the church. And I know we've, we've heard a lot of talk about revival uh, here at community and but, but one of the things that whenever uh, Sean Smith was here in, in, in his book, I Am Your Sign, uh, one of the things that he said was um, about revival was that one, one particular definition of revival is bringing something back to its original purpose. And what God's really been dealing with me about is bringing, that he's wanting to bring the church back to her original purpose. That, that the original purpose, if you read the book of Acts, that the whole reason that the church was formed and created was to change the world. It was, it was not a, it was not a, um, let's go and meet together on the first day of the week. It wasn't a, let's, you know, it's not a, it's not a book club. It's not a social group. It was, it was a catalyst. It was a group of people who were destined and, and created to change the world. Even in the, in the book of Acts chapter 17, I believe it is, uh, where it even says that uh, they, uh, people who were going and, and going against the church saying that these that have turned the world upside down, uh, it is the, the whole purpose that, that he created us for was to, to change the world and to bring about a realization of who Jesus is. And, and and that's what he's calling the church back to, is to, to get back to our roots and get back to, to change in the world. That's what we're here for. That's the whole purpose that, that he's created us for. And, and as I begin to spend time in the book of Acts, he, uh, he showed me a few things that, that the first church did that he's wanting us to get back to. And the very first thing that he showed me, he said, and what I'm about to propose to you is, it's very simple, but it's at the same time very radical. And the, the thing that, that we see that the first church did is that they preached a Jesus-centered, relevant gospel. I want you to think about that. A Jesus Christ-centered, relevant gospel. It was relevant to the time that they were in. It was relevant to, to their location and what they were going through. But it was all focused and based around Jesus. It had everything to do with Jesus. If it, if it had anything to do with anything at all, it was about Jesus. And, and I'm not saying this maybe as the church as a whole, but I think that, that in part we have gotten away from that, but that, that some things have gotten in the way of, uh, of our message, that maybe we've been too focused on some things and not enough focus on Jesus, that, that we, we get focused on the idea of something rather than, than what Jesus is actually calling us to. And, and I'm, I'm thankful to say I don't think we have that problem here at Community. I love my pastor and I love the, the sermons that he, that he brings, and, but, but I, I, I need, we need, and I'm not talking about behind a pulpit, you need to realize that, that each and every one of you have been called to the ministry. Each and every one of you have been given the gift of preaching. You have been called to preach the gospel. We are all called to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not what takes place behind a pulpit in a building like this. It's what takes place out there that's going to change the world. It, it, uh, you know, I can come in here and we can, we can get together and we can talk about Jesus inside here, but if it stays here, then we've missed it. That's not a Jesus-centered gospel. A gospel surrounded by Jesus is one that goes out and turns the world upside down. I've heard it said that 90% of all communication is nonverbal. That means that 90% of what you're saying isn't coming out of your mouth. All of your, your, your attitude, your mannerisms, your, your hand gestures, different things like this, you're going to convey a message whether you are saying anything or not. And what I want you to realize is that whenever you leave this place and you go about your daily lives, whenever you go to your job, your school, uh, your family reunions, wherever you go, you're preaching something. 
You're preaching something wherever you go. Jesus is, is being conveyed, whether it's in a positive way or a negative way. As a Christian, people know that you're a Christian. Are they seeing a, a type of Christianity that they want to have, or are they seeing one that they said, you know what, I could do without that? We're all preaching something. Is it a Christ-centered gospel? Is it, is it surrounded by Jesus? Is it focused on Jesus? Is it, is it where Jesus is at the core of everything that I am? Whenever we get to a point where Jesus is at the core of everything that I am, then whenever, whatever I say, whether I'm quoting scripture or not, that Jesus is in it because he's inside of me. John, John 15 and 4 says, uh, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. We have to be abiding in the vine. The, the, the first verse of chapter 15 says, I am the true vine. We have to be connected to him. We have to be in communion with him. We have to be uh, in that, that, that intimacy with him because if we're not as close to him as we possibly can be, we'll never hear what he's saying and we can't share it with the world. We have to be completely and utterly focused on Christ in everything that we do. A Christ-centered gospel. Uh, I mean, like I said, this is so simple, but it's so radical at the same time. That, that whatever I do, whenever I go to my job and I swipe my badge, I'm swiping it with, with the notion that, you know what, I might not want to be here, but I'm doing it for you, Jesus. This is, this is a means to support my family, and while I'm here, there's going to be people that need to see the Jesus in me. Whenever I go and I'm doing my grocery shopping, wherever I go, I'm going to do it with the focus that, Jesus, you are at the center of it. He has to be our focus. A Jesus-centered gospel. I want to talk to you. This is something that, that God spoke to me in uh, a very familiar passage of Scripture, Acts 2.38. Um, and what I want you to realize for just a moment, I, this is a, I, as we read it, this is a, a command Peter's giving them to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I want us to think abstractly for a moment. I don't want us to... I don't want to talk about water baptism right now. I do believe that water baptism is necessary. I, I, we need to, as Christians, to be water baptized. But I want you to think abstractly for just a few moments about a concept. Uh, he says to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The word baptized there means to immerse. Um, just for example, if I was to take this box of tissue and I had a a bucket of water right here and I just dunk it in the water, I have immersed it in water. But whenever I pull it out, is it still immersed? I've dunked it in the water, I've immersed it, but as soon as I pull it out, the only thing I've done other than ruining every tissue in the box is I've just, I've, I've dunked it in water, I pull it, it's no longer immersed. He says to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, to be baptized into Jesus. I mean, if we can, like I said, let's think abstractly for a moment, to be actually immersed in Jesus. Completely and totally immersed, covered, surrounded by Jesus every single day of our lives. Not just, not just dunked and, and, and come out. I, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about a concept where, where, where I say, Jesus, I, I need you to be completely and totally surrounding me, covering me. Jesus, I want to dive in head first. I don't care if I ever come up for air. Jesus, I need you to be completely and totally around me in every aspect of my life. Being baptized into Jesus, if we can begin to, to grab hold of this and say, you know what, I need him more than I need air in my lungs. I need him more than I need food on my plate. I need him more than absolutely anything this world has to offer. Being baptized into Jesus, can you imagine the things that we'll begin to see in the church? The, the, the things that he wants to do if we can just live a, a Christ-centered life and preach a Christ-centered gospel. The, the, it's endless what, what is available to us if we can just abide in the vine. Now, you might be asking, how am I supposed to do this? Uh, whenever I was in my studies, this is probably, it's a very plain scripture, but it just, it literally leaped out, not literally, figuratively leaped off the page at me. Literally would have been kind of scary. But Acts chapter 4, verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. 
seem, I mean, this is a, the type of scripture that you can read and just fly right past it. But when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke the word of God with boldness. This is the formula for a Christ-centered gospel. Very first thing out the box, they prayed. If we don't have a, a prayer life, if we don't set aside time, if we don't have a connection with the Father, if we're not speaking to him, and, and you know, uh, and I'm, I'm guilty of it too, but as Christians, we think prayer, we, we go out and we, we get on our knees, we find us a place and we just start talking and we talk and we talk and we talk for 15 minutes and we get up and we leave and then we think that was prayer. That's, that's part of it. We have to set aside some time to listen. Because if we're not praying and listening and seeking the Father for what he has in store for his people, we're never going to know. And how are we going to tell those, how are we going to share the gospel if we don't know how he wants us to share it? If we don't know who he, who he wants us to share it with? They prayed. And it says the place where they were assembled together was shaken. That word shaken in the Greek, it actually means movement caused by wind and waves. I mean, that just sounds like the Holy Ghost to me. Uh, to, to think about a spiritual force physically shaking the place where they were. Uh, the Spirit moving in such a way that literally, not figuratively, literally, the, the place where they were was shaken. I mean, can you imagine being in a place and praying and seeking God and, and you feel like you're in an earthquake because the presence of God is moving so strongly? They were filled with the Holy Ghost. Whenever that, whenever that shaking happens, something <laughs> you're going to get filled, and, and God's going to His presence is just going to consume you. You're going to be filled with the Spirit, and then you're going to speak the Word of God with boldness. There's the formula right there. Acts four thirty one. Remember that. Write it down. Highlight it. They prayed. The place was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. We have, to, we have to take this into consideration and, and spend time and, and realize that this Christ-centered gospel has to go forward. When we start spending time in, in, in prayer and we start living this Christ-centered life and, and preaching this Christ-centered gospel, we're going to begin to see some of the most amazing things. We've seen some amazing things here in this church and the, the things that have taken place, uh, you know, in this, this community and around here. Uh, but, but the things that we read about in the book of Acts, it's, it's tremendous. And I want to see these things take place. We read it in the book of Mark. It says, these signs shall follow them that believe. Signs and wonders are destined to follow you as a Christian. When you have you know, submitted yourself to Christ and accepted him as your Savior, you have a birthright. It is your birthright. This is part of your heritage. This belongs to you. These signs and wonders will follow you if you believe. It's what the Word says. This, this isn't me. This is what the Word. I'm just sharing you what the, what the Word says. These signs will follow you if you believe. Signs and wonders. You know, uh, too many times we, we think that, that the miraculous and the supernatural, they're, they're only available to the, to the super Christian. That's not the case. I, I can't find that anywhere in Scripture. We, we hear stories of, of uh, Smith Wigglesworth or Lester Summerall, these great pioneers of the faith. We, we think that there, there was something so special about them that, that it was only available to people like them and that it's not available to us. The, Jesus said in, in uh, uh, John 14, 12, he said, uh, the works that I do, you're going to do them also and greater works than these will you do. Essentially what Jesus was saying, he said, he said, I've, I have caused the lame to be able to walk again. I've, I've seen uh, the, the, the leper come to me with his skin falling off of his, off of his body, and I've, I've healed him to where his skin was like a baby again. I have, I have caused the dead to come alive. I, I even one time spit in the dirt and rubbed it in a man's eyes, and he was able to see again. I even walked on water. All these things that I've done, you're going to be able to do greater than these. Can we just imagine the things that he has in store for his church if we'll just believe, if we'll just spend some time with him? The, the miraculous is destined for you. It's given to you. It's your promise. It's your heritage. It's your birthright. It belongs to you. <laughs> Signs and wonders. We, we have to tap into the vine and, and live this Christ-centered life and let him work through his people. This is how the world is going to change. I, I, I go every day to my job and I spend time, uh, I, I don't work in a Christian environment. 
I work at Walmart. A lot of you say, oh, that's how I know him. But there, I see people every single day, whenever I go to work, that, that you can just see the, the, the pain of life on their face. You can see how this world and the corruption and the sin that this world has to offer, it, it drags and it tears people down. There is a lost and dying world that absolutely and desperately needs Jesus. And the only way that they're ever going to hear about him is through me and you. And when we begin to live this life and we begin to walk in the anointing and the power that, that he has for us, things are going to change. We're going to see some amazing things happen. The, the book of Malachi, the very, last, uh, the very last book of the Old Testament, Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, it says, Behold, I will, send, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. This is a promise of, of sending Elijah before the coming of the Lord. We see also in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, uh, speaking of, of John the Baptist, he says, uh, he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This is speaking of John the Baptist. Malachi prophesied of one coming before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, one coming before the Messiah, uh, walking and in, in working in the power and the spirit of Elijah. And this is, this is where we see John the Baptist. He was, he was the forerunner of Christ. He was, he was the one who came and prepared the way for the Messiah. He set the stage and allowed Christ to come in and perform his earthly ministry. But if you see in Luke 1, 17, it only, it only fulfilled one part of the prophecy. He says that he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And Malachi says that he'll also turn the heart of the children to the fathers. I believe that it is the call of, of the body of Christ to walk in the spirit and the power of Elijah, just like John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. He was the one to usher in the coming of the Messiah. We as the body of Christ are here, set upon this earth for a purpose, and that purpose is to usher in the second coming of Christ. I believe wholeheartedly that we're gonna see the second coming of Christ sooner than we realize, but while we're here, we have to be the voice, just like John, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. We have to, and it's our duty to turn the heart of the children back to the Father. See, John only fulfilled half of it. It's our duty to fulfill the rest of it, to turn the hearts of the children back to the Father. There's a lost and dying world that desperately needs Jesus, and we have to preach this gospel to them and bring them back to the Father. How else will they hear without a preacher? Everybody in here is a preacher. What are you preaching? How are you preaching it? Who are you preaching it to? They need Jesus, and they need the Jesus that's in you. They need the anointing that's in you. See, each and every one of you come in contact every single day with people that I'll never meet. There's people that you can influence and, and, and communicate with and witness to and share the gospel with that I'll never even meet, probably never see them in my life because of just, just the way things work. There, there's people that you can reach that I could never reach. There's people that I know that you'll never be able to know and reach. But, but we as the body of Christ need to come together and spread this gospel. On the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts chapter 2, we see, you know, there's the analogy, uh, you know, when you, if you have a lake and it's, you know, smooth as glass and you take just a pebble and you throw it in there, you know, the ripple effect. That, that's essentially what happened on the day of Pentecost. God was taking a rock and he was throwing it in a pond and he created movement that spread. And we see, we see that the gospel spread from Jerusalem and it just, I mean, it spread just like uh, to the uttermost part of the earth where we are now. This is, this is part of that promise. But that, that rocket spread like this, you know. But 
As you read the book of Acts, you see the story mainly focuses on Peter and Paul, but there were others who were going out and preaching and what they were doing, they were throwing another rock. They were throwing a rock over here and then somebody else is throwing a rock over here and somebody else throws one over here. And and it, it wasn't just like this. It was all these different ones, and it completely disturbed the water. There was waves, and there was movement. There there was completely troubled the water. It's not just a ripple effect. It's completely, it's it's capsizing waves. It's, It's the kind of movement that completely turns things around. It's the kind of movement that we need in the world today. It's going to take people like you to go to your job and create some movement. That kind of wind and the the waves that shook the place where they were assembled together. We need that. We're, We're in your job, in your school, everywhere you go, everywhere I go, we have to bring that movement, that shaking Lord, shake me, shake my place, shake my job, shake my family, wherever I go, shake it with me, Lord. Just let's spread it forth and we'll begin to see that everywhere we're seeing the revival. It doesn't take place just in one place. Uh, this is a beautiful facility, but this is not the church. God spoke this to me and I, I wrote it down. He spoke it very clearly and you've probably, uh, the church is not a building. And I'm sure that you probably already know that. Most people know that the church is not a building. The church is also not a people. The church is a vehicle. The body of Christ is a people, but the church is a vehicle. The church is a vehicle for moving Jesus from point A to point B. It's a means of of taking the gospel from here to there. It is is a a way that we can move the gospel from place to place. It it is never meant to be still. It was never meant to, to, to stay in one place. It was meant to be constantly moving. We have to be constantly moving, bringing the, the gospel to the lost and the dying world. That's what it's all about. As we preach this Christ-centered gospel and we begin to see the signs and wonders following, we see also in in the book of Acts that just even on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached, that 3,000 people were added to the church. And just just a little while later, 5,000. We we even read that multitudes were added daily. The church grew by leaps and bounds, I mean, very rapidly. The state of the church today, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we're growing as rapidly as they were. I mean, obviously, it was brand new. It was exponential growth. But, but what I'm, I, believe that, I believe this with all my heart, that, that God wants the church to be growing at a rate so fast. I, I, I want to see that... On, on a Sunday morning and a Sunday night, this sanctuary is filled to capacity that people are, are sticking their heads through the doors and that we have to open up all these doors. We have to put screens out in the, the large columns for people to see, but not just here, down at First Baptist and down at Victory Life Church and down at the, the Nazarene Church because every church in the, in the city of Orange is filled to capacity that they're going, trying to find a place where they can get in touch with Jesus. It's not just here, it's everywhere. It's a gospel that needs to be spread and it's a gospel that's gonna bring people in. I want to see the church growing. Not, not, not community church. I want to see community church growing, but the body of Christ growing so much that every church is, is having to implement a building plan. I, I, I guarantee you that if every person in the city of Orange were to get saved and become a regular attending church member, we wouldn't have enough there's not enough room to hold them. There's not enough room. Oh, well, Brother Stephen, that's just impossible. We're, we're, not, we're not that kind of a fanatic people that's just going to believe that a whole city is going to get saved. What happened in Nineveh? I believe that I serve an unlimited God. The only thing that limits God is me. We have to get rid of this stinking thinking that that certain things are only available to certain churches and certain people because that is absolutely not scriptural. 
I want to see people filling this house. I want to see, I want to see in the middle of, of, of worship, drug addicts coming and getting delivered. I want to see uh, people who, who have nowhere else to go coming to the house of God because AA won't work anymore because they can't find any help anywhere else and they come to the house of God and they get their lives turned around. We have to be the kind of people that will accept them. Not based on their credentials, not based on the kind of clothes that they're wearing, but based on the fact that they need Jesus. The church is going to grow. The, uh, Jesus, uh, he, he, never, he never sat back and said, you know what, well, you know, I had some really good men about 50 years ago. They were, you know, doing some awesome things, but I really don't see anybody that I can use right now. We'll just wait another generation and let somebody else do it. No, he's, he, all he's requiring, he said, these signs shall follow them that believe. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is believe. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for just a moment. First thing out of the box, if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I beg you, please do not leave this place without making that amazing decision to follow him. I'll pray with you. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you everything that you want to know about Jesus. And if I don't know, we'll look through the Bible and we'll find it together. But if you don't know Jesus, now is as good a time as any to come and make a, a, a relationship with him. Maybe you can say, you know, Brother Stephen, I've, I want to preach this this Jesus-centered gospel that you're talking about. I, I, I let the, the cares of this world get to me. I, I let it drain me. I let it wear me down. If that's you, I want to pray with you. If you want to work in the, the prophetic and the miraculous, there is an anointing for you. It, it, it's there. All you have to do is tap into it. I'm going to ask, as the musicians come back up, I'm going to ask you to, if you would like prayer, I want to pray with you. I want, I want to be able to, to pray with you that this, this, uh, this anointing that you, you want, this, this, this desire that you have will be, will be fulfilled. Uh, if, if you need Jesus, I want to pray with you. I'm going to ask you, if, if any of this that I've said has is, is resonated in your heart, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and come to the front. And I want to pray with you. Oh, come on. We've, we've got to have some people who want to change the world in this place. Amen. I'm going to ask others, if you, if you feel like you, you're where you need to be, I'm just going to ask as they play some worship music, I'm, just come to the front. Let's just worship. Let's spend some time in his presence. He is here. The presence of God is here, and he wants to minister to you. He wants to, you, I don't have to lay hands on you. It doesn't have anything to do with me. It's all about him. But if you want, if you want special prayer, I'm just going to ask you just to come in a little bit closer. Others, I'm going to invite you just to come up to the front and, and just some, spend some time in worship. And we're just going to let God have his way. He is, he is here. He wants to meet you where you are. He wants to, to, to just completely and totally fulfill your life and fulfill your heart's desires. He wants to use you and change you and turn the world upside down with you. Let's just begin to worship. <laughs> Father, we thank you. We just release your presence in this place. We give you freedom in this place just to pour out your, your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, use us to change the world. 
Lord, we want to we want to see we want to see Orange Texas completely and totally immersed and submerged in Jesus. We want to see the 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 we want to see uh, drug addicts set free. We want to see we want to see revival break loose. That it would start here and it would spread. That it would would uh, that the, the churches would be full. That the house would be full. That 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 people are surrendering their lives to the ministry. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, have your way. As the Holy Spirit's moving in this place, and we appreciate Stephen and the message that he brought. I love what he said. He said, we're all preaching a message. Who are we preaching it to? What are we saying? But we're preaching a message. And this idea of living out the gospel every moment of our lives. I really believe, like Stephen, that every one of us, there's a call on our lives. We're all gifted slightly differently. But there's still a call and a kingdom that we represent. So I want to encourage you, as we're praying together, maybe get in little clusters and begin to speak into each other's life. Pray over one another. Stir up the gifts inside of you. Stir up the gifts inside of each other because until we move it beyond a few and begin to embrace our identity in Christ, Doing the things he talked about outside these, outside these doors stays foreign to us. 
So if you're here and you're waiting for a touch or a prayer, get in a little group and begin to touch and to begin to pray. And Stephen can go around and, and pray in those clusters as well. But I'm convinced that God's wanting us to begin to live out that gospel in ourselves. Byron was just coming. Byron's a part of our body. He's also ministering. He said, there's someone here tonight that has had a little war going on inside of them about a call to ministry. That God's got a call in your life and you've been kind of wrestling. Is this the right time or not? Well, God's saying it's the right time. He's talking to you. And began to step out in faith. Do you appreciate Stephen tonight? Did you appreciate? Well, he's like that Energizer bunny. We wound him up and he gets going. Of course, he's a big bunny. He's like Harvey. Well, God, we appreciate you. And I appreciate what the Holy Spirit's doing right now. So we're going to keep playing. And uh, so I just really encourage you. Begin to pray for one another. Speak over one another. And brother, we appreciate you.
Eu sei 